Welcome to EPC Conversations. Thank you very much for tuning in and joining us. And I'm absolutely delighted to be welcoming my guest, uh, Professor Sir Tom Devine today. Uh, Tom is a renowned uh, historian, uh, written many popular books, uh, a serious academic scholar as well. And given that he has studied the the Scottish landscape so thoroughly in terms of its history, um, in no small part he'll be able to contribute a huge amount to some of our thoughts about where the church is today and where it's come from historically and, and help us understand things a little bit more fully. So I hope to have a conversation with him uh, about the history of the church in Scotland and, and perhaps, what, uh, as with any good history conversation, see what lessons we can learn uh, from today from that. So welcome, Tom. Thank you. Uh, very much for joining us and uh, m maybe I'd like to start by asking you uh, just what got you interested in, in studying Scottish history in such depth in the first place. Well good morning David, uh, I'm really delighted to be asked to, to be with you this morning. Um, it's a very strange story because uh, I found when I went to secondary school I found a history boring and um, gave it up as a subject um, after two years in those days, and I think possibly today, still you can select what social, so-called social subjects you can you take. And it really wasn't until I went to university, and to, uh, I went to Strathclyde University, and in those days they had five, a five subject year that you had to complete in first year. And so I had to take alternative subjects in addition to my specializations, and one of them was history. And I was taught um, uh, in that year and thereafter when I selected to do joint honours history and English um, by very skilled and enthusiastic uh, teachers. Ironically enough, almost all of them um, had been schooled in English universities. They'd come north because of the huge expansion in the university system. And they enthused me, they stimulated me because so much of the teaching, especially eventually at the senior level, was based on their own research. So that 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 was how the bug came to me. As far as the Scottish experience is concerned, um, the the Burnett Fletcher Professor of um, History at Aberdeen University gave his inaugural lecture in 1964, and he said that the history of modern Scotland is less studied than the history of Yorkshire. In other words. To a large extent, in the 1960s, the whole of Scottish history from, say, the late 17th century onwards was not completely tabula rasa, but it was, there were so many big themes still to explore. And that was that was the foundation, therefore, of my research, research career. Um, I graduated in 1968 and then started my doctorate. And by very good fortune, uh, I was able to get a job in the university as an assistant lecturer in the first year of my doctorate. Uh, and that was that's the origins of the story. It's uh, yeah, and I think it'd probably be surprising for folks uh, in the contemporary picture to to realize to hear that that Scottish history was so um, understudied, uh, given that the, there is now an enormous amount of focus yeah. on it. And obviously, I mean, I, a lot I, has changed. Absolutely, David. I mean, I've lived through a, a revolution in the subject. Um, I mean, in the 60s in particular, there was a decisive break with the past irrelevance and marginalization. One's got to remember, of course, that medieval Scottish history uh, had always had a certain vibrancy. The problem was the history of the modern nation, particularly the modern nation within the Union. And that has been the contribution of the last generation and of this generation uh, to transform that. And as you say, the the number of monographs and articles that flow from the press is quite a, quite astonishing. And given that uh, you have focused so intensively on on the, the Scottish nation, um, it, it may perhaps be surprising uh, to the wider Scottish populace today the extent to which uh, religion and particularly church history has been inseparable from the development of the Scottish nation. But um, I was hoping we could talk about that. And uh, in terms of the kind of people that we look to as, you know, it's very popular for us to see 
uh, perhaps William Wallace and, and Robert the Bruce as, as archetypal Scottish heroes. Um, but I think you've alluded to in previous uh, writings and so on that that wasn't always the case, that very much the religious history was something that was seen as, as heroic uh, at one time. Well, yeah, I mean, the religion was core. Uh, and obviously it was core not simply in terms of historiography, because so many of the writers um, uh, in the past were ministers of the Church of Scotland or were um, academics um, with a with a religious educational background in the universities. Uh, and if you take just one example, um, especially in the 19th and early 20th centuries, the literal obsession with the era of the Covenanters uh, and the attempt to explain why it developed, Covenanting developed, what it was like and what its effect was, uh, that, that, that could be regarded for much of the 19th century as is a salient, um, a salient an aspect of academic interest as any of the subjects, the more secular subjects, obviously, which are studied today. Uh, and broadly, what was the view? Because obviously, I, I, I've read some contemporary 20th century history on the Covenant and it, it's not particularly favourable. Was there a time where it was seen in the, in the broader history as, as more of a, a golden era of, of let's say, um, you know, moral courage? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would say that uh, there was two possible wings, two two possible perspectives. One was highly favourable. You know, the ancestry of Scottish religion, um, uh, the continued development of Scottish religion, especially against Erastianism and also uh, royal interference in the 17th century, was very much a factor, of course, in the Covenanting movement. And there are still a huge number of biographies extant, which um, picked over the heroic figures uh, of of those uh, two movements. One in the seventeenth mid seventeenth century, and of course the other later on at the um, near the end of the seventeenth century. But at the other extreme, especially uh, during the Scottish Enlightenment and its in its aftermath, uh, the, the, there's the other school which regarded. Um, uh, the Covenanters as fanatic. And of course, the best thing in their view that could have happened was for them to have been uh, beaten, to have their cause defeated. And that was especially strong in the moderate so-called wing of the Church of Scotland, which became uh, really all powerful from the mid 18th century up to the disruption of 1843. So, so mm. the consequence of these two uh, different um, perspectives was um, uh, sometimes very stimulating, but also sometimes very acrimonious uh, argument in print, and of course in public performances like sermons and uh, lectures, etc. It was um, it was a very a very big thing. Um, it was in fact one of the key historical controversies uh, of the Victorian era. And, and what would you say, you know, for uh, perhaps for our, any of our uh, viewers who aren't particularly familiar with that era in history, what would you say was the main uh, contention with the Covenanters period and how would history perhaps have unfolded in your view differently had, had they not had the measure of success that they had? Well, in, in, a, in a very short compass, uh, because it's a complicated story, but essentially the, the people who signed the Covenant... Um, and regarded themselves as having a covenant with God. To them, this was about eternal salvation and eternal values, which is why many of them are prepared to take up the sword in defense of their of their beliefs. Um, one key element was the possible interference of the state in matters which were sacred and divine, because their view was there that they had a direct connection with the deity. Um, and secular authority should not have any part uh, in that. And in the 17th century, because of the known power of religion to affect men's minds and women's minds, the state, not simply in Scotland, but in, in, in Europe, also always had a stake, S-T-A-K-E, a stake in trying to influence and indeed command uh, religious authority. Um, I mean, the religion in the 17th century was not simply a religious element, in quote marks. 
But if you take the the annual and very long sermons that occurred in the Church of Scotland in that period, those were the main vehicles of media expression at the time. That's how people who came to the Kirk uh, in very large numbers in that period, that's how they got their news and that's how also they got their worldview, their mortality. So it was inevitable that the state would have a concern in these issues. Mm. It's interesting, and as you're talking, it's, it's almost like the debate that's happening in our world over how much should the state get involved to regulate social media, given that's where people are mostly exposed to whatever information that they're getting. But that was the pulpit in, in the 17th century. Yeah, I mean, it's you could say there's a constant between our values and our issues and our controversies and those of that pre-union period that I've just alluded to. Um, because uh, there's always a tension between, if you like, state interference and state regulation. Sometimes it can be very extreme, like, for example, uh, the intervention of, interventionism of something like Stalinist, Stalinist Russia or Nazi Germany. But there's always a tension between human liberty, the desire to behave in a certain way, um, uh, and the, the other if you like, authority, the authority of the state, which is always tempted to interfere, to regulate human behaviour. I mean, our controversies in that respect um, would be unknown to a 17th century person, but at root, um, they're, they're, they're about matters which are fundamental to, if you like, human nature uh, and human values. It, it, uh, yes, and as you're speaking, it's reminded me of, I remember one of my church history lectures when I was doing divinity, um, saying that you could, in one sentence, the, the story of the Scottish church was the relationship between the church and state was just never resolved. No. Um, although it's and you perhaps... It never will be resolved by very necessity because they claim different loyalties. And of course, the church uh, can argue rightly that its loyalty is a higher loyalty. But unfortunately, I'm not simply talking about Scotland here, I'm talking about globally. Um, secular states uh, usually have the upper hand in terms of, if you like, both political authority, but also sometimes when the, when it's required to be used, military capability. Mm. And, it, I mean, it sounds like we've travelled a long way from the times where, you know, the state had an interest in, in influencing uh, uh, the the religious order because it was such an influence on so many people. That's not the picture of Scotland today, um, given the recent census. Um, the, most people are not religious or church going. So when would you say was the real high point in, in Scottish history of, of the church's influence, if you like? Um, well, of course, you, you've got to differentiate between different different churches. But if, you, if, for example, since we're talking um, at least up to this point about the Church of Scotland and, if you like, the related Protestant churches, I mean, the great irony of the story is that the membership level of the Church of Scotland reached its historic peak in the late 1950s. Now, that's, exact, that's the decade before what um, one writer has called um, uh, a, a catastrophic hemorrhage in numbers beginning to occur in the following decade, that is the 1960s. So it is deeply ironic that if, if you simply use the criterion of membership, the membership levels of church going, in particular of church going Protestant people, uh, was actually at its height in fairly recent times. So the, the, the picture you've drawn, uh, David, about decline uh, has been quite extraordinary in its speed. It's almost like a kind of tsunami. And of course, you, 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 you probably be aware, I keep using the word membership, and also the, the, the issue of church attendance. Um, th this has got to be differentiated from if you like, the beliefs of people, the emotions of people, mu much of that very private. And that is, those, those, those of us who study secularization, not all of us, but some of us at least, are very much aware of the need to tread carefully. I mean, and especially, yeah, yeah. of course, if you look at the global picture, there's yeah, no yeah. you could argue 
in, in, in terms of the evidence as at 2020, that secularization has won the battle because religious belief is still one, not necessarily Christian, but religious belief in general, is still one of the key tenets of human behavior globally. Yes, yeah, and, and we, we can be um, guilty of being perhaps myopic in the West and forget that uh, there's an explosion of religious belief and, you know, evangelical vigor and yeah. a lot of the... Um, the Southern Hemisphere, uh, a lot of the Far East, and they're going through perhaps sorts of reformations like we had uh, centuries oh, ago. Absolutely. And you take one closer to home. Um, you know, um, I've given a few lectures in recent years in, in Russia, and it's quite obvious there there is, a, there is a, a distinct religious revivalism has been going on since the loosening of the grip of the communist state uh, on, uh, on religious uh, activity. Mm. Um, and of course, there's, the, there's also the very curious case, um, you know, because some scholars argue that capitalism and religion don't work. So with the victory of capitalism uh, and individualism, um, if you want to put it more crudely, the victory of greed and, um, and uh, human e egocentricity, then religion is, is in its death throes. But the most capitalist orientated state on the planet is the USA. And it's also one of the most um, religious in terms of church attendance and church affiliation. So there's a lot of, there's ironies and paradoxes in this. And I don't think we're yet in the position of being able to determine uh, whether what's, ha what's happening in some parts of Europe is necessarily going to be typical of the planet in a hundred years time. Certainly, and and the the picture you're drawing is that there is no um there's there's not a simple uh, narrative in terms of the relationship between secularity and capitalism and and, and um, religious faith, but uh, coming back to Scotland as somebody who has um, said you you know you've studied secularism itself to a degree, what would you say have been the main drivers or tectonic shifts? In, in Scotland particularly that have uh, led to or aided the decline in at least um, what the figures we find in a census in terms of uh, church attendance and religious belief. As I say, you're absolutely right to make a differentiation between belief, even if it's um, uh, 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 you know, belief in a, in a deity and, and uh, the Christian values, if you like, um, and uh, actually going to church. Um, well, the, the key decade in this um, was the 1960s, um, and that was the that was the for young people especially that you know that was the decade of the growth of what you may call liberation of, from the earlier structures which perhaps governed the activities of the young in the past. It was also the period of a massive increase in popular enter entertainment. And you could say, if you want to date um, individualism and uh, the growth of a more materialistic society, it really is from about the late 50s, 60s onwards. And, and I think all of these factors, um, you know, just to take one example, the range of uh, secular entertainments, you've got to remember that going to church was a social experience for many people, as well as a religious experience, the opportunity to meet friends and talk to them after the services. But with the massive increase in media and television, etc., cetera, um, that's been replaced to a great degree by other forms of human intercourse. Uh, so I think, that, I think those, those factors are, I mean, I think we are a much more, did I say it, um, in, in Western Europe at least, much more egotistical people than we were 50 or 100 years ago. There's a greater sense of me, a greater sense of self. And that means that community structures are often, they're not, they're not wiped out in any sense, but they, they, they transform in different, different directions. And that perhaps there isn't the sense of community that there used to be. An abiding factor in community, of course, was shared religious belief. Now, there is one interesting differential here, because I'm very interested in comparative history um, and have been uh, really since about the 1980s. And that is, in order to determine 
um, the you know the, res- the, the a factor operating in one country, or a factor operating in a particular historical problem, it helps to get an answer to that if you compare it with what's happening elsewhere. And just to give an example, one of the things I worked on I worked on is um, why was there industrialization in Scotland in the 18th century from a very poor society? When you look across the Irish Sea. Both societies were more or less at the same level around about 1700. By the mid 19th century, one had the greatest human catastrophe in Western European history, the Great Irish Famine. Mm. And Scotland was the second richest nation on the planet. Why? And the way you get trying to get an answer to that is comparing the various social, intellectual, economic, and indeed even geological processes, which separated, separated to two issues. So my comparator for the history of the Church of Scotland in the modern area is uh, Catholicism in Scotland. Because, as you know, from 2001, um, the census asked that you should give you religious affiliation uh, in response to the the relevant question in the census. So 2001 and 2011 have given those, uh, those important data. And we await, of course, the census of 2020. The census is partly the reason why, you know, there's angst in the Church of Scotland about so-called membership collapse. But if you look at the the pattern, uh, the the Roman Catholic pattern, it's been been averaging around about 16 to 17% for the last 20 to 30 years. I mean, obviously much smaller uh, than the, the Church of Scotland estimates for the 1950s and 1960s. But it hasn't moved down very much. So one intriguing, if you like, research project might be to compare the two experiences. That's not to say in any sense that the Roman Catholic Church in Scotland has not been hemorrhaging. You, know, you only have to speak to, to school teachers uh, in the denominational system uh, to discover that the young are leaving, or at least many of the young are leaving the church, despite the fact, of course, that a key aspect of the denominational school system is to create this so-called atmosphere of Catholicism and the teaching of Christian and Catholic values within that. It really doesn't It doesn't seem to have interrupted the, um, the outward flow to the extent that the schools would like to see But nevertheless, the total number and percentage of those claiming affiliation to the Catholic Church has hardly moved at all. Now, that might not be the case at the next census, but it is the case at the moment in terms of known data. So the big question is why? Very interesting. And uh, I wonder if uh, I I could posit uh, perhaps a straw man as to why, and and maybe you could knock it down. But um, some historians have noted that... um, Within Christianity from the Reformation onwards, and, and let's just say Scotland's no different in this regard, that it, it had in its uh, reforming and, and revolutionary character the seeds of its own destruction. Mm-hmm. Another way of saying that, that um, because of that tectonic shift and break with um, previous religious institutions and structures in the Catholic Church, and the uh, dictum of Martin Luther that the Church should reform and always be reforming, that eventually it was going to progress through um, increasingly rationalistic outlooks and steps and eventually end up at full-blown secularization. And and that's where we are. Um, Well, obviously, one of the the key differences, in in my view, um, and I'm thinking here particularly of the the origins of that extraordinary phenomenon in the 18th century, the Scottish Enlightenment, uh, which in print I've argued is Scotland's greatest cultural and intellectual gift to the world. And one of the root causes of that was the the, the, the intellectualism, um, the the aspect of the mind in Scottish Protestant Protestantism, which of course often ended up in bitter controversy uh, among um, ministers and and, and uh, scholars. And of course, in the 18th and early 19th centuries, it uh, led to um, schismatic activity and the growth eventually of what became the Free Church in 18, 
1843. But ironically enough, I would regard that as a sign of vitality, a sign of liveliness because of the the energy that went into dis disputation. Whether that ends up eventually in uh, a secular experience uh, is difficult to conclude. Again, if we go to the if we go to the um, American uh, exemplar, then probably the most vigorous parts of um, uh, the on the ongoing importance and popularity of Christianity in America is evangelicalism, and evangelicalism has even had is starting to have, to have a significant hit on Roman Catholicism in South America as 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 well. Um, now you could argue. Some aspects of evangelicalism are the are are, are the uh, are in contradiction to austere intellectualism, uh, but nevertheless, there's a strong emphasis on the word, etc. Uh, reading the reading the Bible, um, so I would I would prefer David to see the origins of that differentiation that I described a few minutes ago between our two churches in Scotland at least on the surface. We're not talking about the reality of men and women's commitment internally, spiritually and emotionally. It's the public numbers we're talking about. Um, uh, I would see the differentiation as being caused by other factors. And I, I think some, as far as the Catholic community is concerned, I think some of those factors are by definition time limited. In other words, this stability in membership may not necessarily last for very much longer. Mm, yeah. And, and um, you want me to expand on that? Uh, it, yeah, well, it, it sounds like you're, you're uh, on the verge of making a prediction about the next census. Uh, well, no, I'm not, I'm not about that, but I mean, I, I think it's, let me put it this way, I think it's, you know, um, I don't, or maybe you don't know, uh, uh, in 2014, because I remember it because it was the date of the, the independence referendum, I was on the Today programme and uh, Jim Nocte, who was then employed in the Today programme on Radio 4, uh, asked me to predict the result. And I, I thought immediately of saying this, and I've used it ever since, the future is not my period. I'm an historian. <laughs> so I cannot in any sense definitively predict. But one thing you can, you can do as an historian is see the broad chronological context and where our period um, the uh, you know the um, second um, decade of the 20th century how it fits into a previous historical flow if you like but what you've got to guard against because one of the things we have seen I mean who could have predicted COVID for example is that um, events dear boy as Harold Macmillan had it events dear boy can change things fundamentally but I think if if you look at the the general trend as far as uh, Catholic affiliation is concerned um, uh, in the West, and uh, we're thinking of our own country. I think there's likely to be another. Uh, there's likely to be a downturn. Uh, one of the things that's helped to keep that number up, ironically enough, has been Polish immigration, which has been quite significant. But there are two other reasons. I think I I, I criticised the the schools a few minutes ago. But there can be little doubt that if, and I know many Church of Scotland ministers um, are envious of the Catholic Church in this respect, but if you've got a kind of faith-based um, um, uh, school context, that's bound to have some effect on continued loyalty. And of course, the second thing is you've got to look at the background, um, the historical background of um, uh, the Catholic population of Scotland, leaving aside the Italians and the Poles overwhelmingly they are the grandchildren and great-grandchildren of Irish immigrants, and they had a hard time. So there was a lot of communal identity. A lot of, it seems to me, a lot of the continued affiliation uh, and membership in the, in the Catholic Church is a reflection of that earlier age where it provided, religion provided, not simply a source of spirituality for Catholic people in Scotland, but actually a source of solidarity and identity. Now, the, the Catholics have now reached occupational parity in the 1990s. The fact that so many of them voted for independence in the west of Scotland in 2014, that seems to me they are now confident 
and comfortable in their Scottish skins. And if that is the case, then if you like to call it the mutuality of the old solidarity and religion as an identity, not simply as a source of spirituality, that's bound to decline. It's um, it's interesting, and there's an enormous amount there, but I think one, um, if you like, complementary reflection from a, a Protestant point and a Church of Scotland parish set up point of view, yeah. which is, you know, my main area of yes. being able to discuss, is that we do find a similar thing even amidst the um, rampant decline in numbers and, and sec yeah. secularisation. I even find this myself as a parish minister. You do have folks who uh, will drift back yes. um, in their perhaps 20s and 30s and yeah. they're maybe having their own children and starting to think, yeah. I actually have an identity. I, I was baptised in the parish church and yeah. I think I would now like to well, have no, something yeah, similar. In any way, it's sense suggesting that Protestant people don't have an identity, um, David. But you're absolutely right about coming back. Uh, I have had five. I have five children. Um, one we lost one, uh, a twin son, um, a number of years ago. But the other four, that virtually all gave up the faith. They're all back now. Regular attenders. That's. Um... Yeah, it, it's an interesting phenomenon, and it seems to be repeated. It's not just anecdotal. It, it, yes. um, there seems to be a trend. Um, and I can't help but wonder if there is, you know, obviously I, I think it's wonderful that there's vitality in any religious community, but I am in the Church of Scotland, and I suppose I'm, uh, I think that there's something actually quite um, good that we've inherited in the parish system that perhaps helps to engender that sense of religious yeah, identity. the parish system is absolutely fundamental. But I think there's, there's one thing I think we've got to, uh, uh, at least I hope we can agree about, and and that is that um, uh, uh, attachment to Christianity, and especially if it means, uh, as it used to do, the attend regular attendance at services, um, given all the other attractions, if you like, in modern life, um, if you if you're a committed Christian, it's a hard. It's a hard and demanding master, uh, especially compared, you know, to keep the um, uh, the values intact among these, the, if you want to use a, a religious terminology, the massive array of temptations of, of modern of modern life. Um, so it the very fact that the numbers are smaller. Um, uh, there's a qualitative aspect to those numbers. Uh, which perhaps there wasn't uh, to the same degree in the past, where, where people attended church because it was the it was the social thing to do. It was the custom. It was part of the culture. So mm -hmm. um, I, I uh, perhaps like yourself, I'm quite optimistic, um, especially as I say when you think of the hard struggle that any Christian dispensation is going to have in a world of materialism and rampant individualism. Yeah, that that's um, a fascinating point. And, you know, superficially, the hope is there that, well, there's not going to be much of a incentive or even social benefit to coming to church in the age to come. So um, at least we know the folks that will be there are really going to want to be there. Yeah, um, exactly. And that, but, that's, that's the yeah. same thing you would hear from the lips of a Catholic priest as well. <laughs> Identically. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. Well, we, I'm sure we have lots in common. It, well, we're all we're all entering this way and and feeling our way into increasing individualism, secularization, and materialism. And we're all. But but as you said, that would make you hopeful. I actually am hopeful um, because the other thing that I think is hugely positive about that is. In a world where we can't provide cutting edge entertainment, nor do mm. I think we should be trying. Um, we can provide an awful lot of material or societal or social um, capital to people yeah. individually. Absolutely. What we can provide is the connection with the divine. Yeah. And yeah. Um, and, and nobody else is in that game. Absolutely. That's the other side of the coin, right? That you have all these materialistic uh, temptations, but man is not simply a material being. Man with a capital M, that is man and woman. Uh, <laughs> 
are looking for something beyond that. Um, and that's why the, the spirit has always had such a, po a powerful role in, um, in human history. And I don't think that you can cancel that particular aspect of humanity out just like that. Um, mm -hmm. The search will go on and the impulses will, will, will be there. They may, they may, in my view, this is me predicting the future again, <laughs> uh, wrongly, um, but they may, they, may, they may take different forms, but I think that search uh, will, 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 will still be there, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, ongoing. And, of course, the other aspect of it is the, 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 the awareness of the human mind and the human spirit about mortality, about the end of life and what comes after that. Uh, that eternity can only, it seems to me, um, be at least partially configured, apart from those who might say there's nothing afterwards. It can only be partially configured in terms of a religious answer. Uh, yes, so there's still, um, uh, we're still trading on something that's, that's quite unique if, if folks are looking for that kind of level of answers. And, and even just as you say, I, I have to agree that... Um, I remember someone posting a, a photo on social media recently of some of the, the Black Lives Matter yes. protests. Um, uh, and I forget whether it was in the States or in the UK where we had some. But there was um, a uniformity of people raising hands and, and um, kind of taking part in a sort of chant together. And the caption was, the religious impulse is impossible to eradicate. Mm. Well, I mean... Uh... We're talking about something which has been there long before uh, the birth of Christ. You know, it's been there uh, for millennia. We can even, we can even to some extent, conclude about it from cave paintings uh, of her, of her um, uh, long ago ancestors as part of the human race. What about not just that? You know, religion historically has. Um, scratch that itch that we seem to have spiritually as humans to connect beyond ourselves but what about the terms of the difference it makes um i don't know if you're you, you're familiar with the quote that it was said of some uh i think evangelical protestants they were of um too much of a heavenly mind to have any earthly good yes. um has that always been the case in scotland or as a historian have you seen some overlapping between religious impulse and social good and societal oh, yes. action. I mean, what we've got to understand is that uh, even modern Scotland, Scotland in 2020, its um, historical fabric has been fashioned by religion. Um, it's one of the very prime influences, which has not simply affected, if you like, the, the life of the spirit and the relig religious, qua religious aspect, but it's affected everything from the economy, human interrelationship, society, culture, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, per perhaps because it's only in recent times that uh, the history of the country has been taught, especially the modern history of the country, has been uh, taught. Um, it's only recently it's started to be taught systematically, and I have to say that comparing what it was like when I was at school to some of the um, uh, some of the awareness I now have of what's done in school and how it's taught, you know, learning from what my grandchildren uh, are asked to do. It's night and day. So there is a much greater awareness. Well, there will be a much greater awareness in the new generations of where they came from. And that therefore that means if it's taught properly, uh, that there must that the, the, the religious influence in the development of Scotland, uh, you know, since really this, the first Christian missionaries uh, in the country, has been absolutely fundamental. I go back to what would seem like, on the face of it, a secular development. That is the the rationalism of the Enlightenment the questioning of the divine, which was part of the Enlightenment, the questioning of, uh, the, the, sorry, the view put forward 
um, that secular um, affairs can be autonomous from the deity, etc. But the irony is that most of the thinkers, especially in the Scottish Enlightenment, some of them were actually trained ministers, and others, of course, um, had still regarded life through subspecia eternitatis, under the veil of heaven, uh, as, as, as it were. And it was um, the, 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 the view, this is, this is getting into a bit more technical detail, but just one point on it. A lot of historians now think that Calvinism was the original social science because it dealt with the society's connection with the deity. And then, if you like, the, when, when the, the values of Calvinism were secularized, that was an important pivot for this great intellectual development of the 18th century. So that's just one example of the way that religion has gripped all aspects of human behavior in this country, and indeed in all countries, uh, down, to, down to the present day. It seems to me that churchmen don't really boast about this enough. <laughs> that, you know, we are the creatures. We are the creatures <clears throat> of that past. Mm -hmm. It's it's fascinating, and because you've mentioned Calvinism, I, I can't help myself from wanting to delve into that a wee bit more. Um, I, I I of course have I've benefited greatly um, from Calvin's work in, in studying for divinity, um, and often on a weekly basis. So f for me, um, you know, some of Calvin's big ideas that kind of I can imagine would contribute to some of that framework would be, um, you know, the 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 as much as we're all religious, the fact that we're all um, a bit bent out of shape morally. Um, yeah. And so we need law and order. We need restraints. Um, in, uh, we need deterrence in order not to uh, let our own corrupt influences run amok. Yeah. Um, and then secondly, the fact that um, what Calvin, I think Calvin called um, common grace, that while you know, God has uh, special saving benefits for those who come into an experience of faith, that he still, um, through his innate goodness, desires to spread out some benefits to the rest of mankind, regardless of their feelings about him. Yeah. And from that, you might get the seeds of a national health care system and uh, a social safety net. Absolutely. Is that, am I on the right lines? Absolutely, completely, because essentially what you're saying, and I'm, I'm, let me go back to if you like, the intelitocracy, those, that part of human society which is trying to understand who we are, where we came from and what we do and what are the influences, uh, um, uh, what are the influences upon us. Some of the great philosophical works, if not most of the great philosophical works, historically have been about morality, have been about the, co the, the right conduct of human beings in relation to their fellow men and women. I mean, if you look even at the the writings of um, Scotland's greatest philosopher, who's currently by, being traduced by my, own, my own University of Edinburgh, if you look at his writings, and although he was almost certainly verging on atheism, they are uh, powerfully moulded uh, by, if you like, the moral values of the Gospels and of the Bible and of Christian teaching. Because what he's searching for is a way of understanding how humans should interact in a morally acceptable fashion. Uh, and, and, I, I presume you're talking about David Hume. Yes. And, uh, and th th there was a there was a poll carried out of some of the leading figures in global philosophy a few years ago, uh, the creme de la creme of the philosophy pro professoriate. And uh, who was the greatest philosopher of all time? Uh, Hume won. Mm. Um, but they're still renaming his building at, uh, at the University of Edinburgh. <laughs> well, th that's interesting in itself because it shows that we are having an increasingly complex relationship with history. Yeah. Um, but it, which is one of which makes it so well, from my point of view, makes it so exciting. I mean, the thing is, David, if there was a a generally accepted view about some of our, our past, I would be out of a job. Well, I am out of a job because I'm no longer salaried. Uh, 
but I'd be out of a profession. <laughs> so mm-hmm. one of the great things about his about my my subject is the clash of ideas. Mm. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that all ideas and interpretations are of equal value, because some of them are nonsense. But that there are, you know, if you're dealing with human motivation, as so many historians are, it's very difficult to get something. So I used to teach my students, all I'm asking for you is that you present your views in a cogent and effective way based on evidence. Um, uh, try to be as detached as possible. Um, you're really, in a sense, you're creating a, almost a, like a lawyer creating a criminal case, either for or against. And the key element is to be as convincing in your interpretation as possible. Not that you've finally reached the holy grail of truth, because mm-hmm. although that's what we search for, mm-hmm. It's almost impossible to know whether we've got it or not. I think that's fascinating in itself, and that a lot of your rhetoric there sounds so similar to what some of my best lecturers said to me in studying divinity. Is um, and and it's it's hermen- history, I suppose, is hermeneutics. It's how do we interpret? How do we um, assure ourselves that our interpretation is as solid as it possibly can be, while always retaining the humility to go. I think there's still more I could be, have learned. Of course, yes. Um, and, you know, even if one of the things I've learned is you can have a store of facts um, uh, uh, which are available and have been available, say, for 100 years. Um, so this is not necessarily because you're researching new facts. It's just that the perspective changes change over time and the interest of some important elements compared to others are given fresh, fresh assessment. Uh, because the, the other aspect is, um, uh, unlike my colleagues in science and uh, engineering and, and indeed even medicine, uh, we are dealing um, in the social sciences and the humanities with what makes people tick. You know, what, what, what's the driver behind human motivation? And that is much more demanding exercise. And that's why I sometimes refer to my subject, but it's only because it's one of several humanities and social science subjects as the queen of disciplines, partly to annoy my my colleagues in the hard sciences, who sometimes uh, feel us a degree of superiority over humanities and arts. <laughs> that, yeah, well, that uh, that seems to be a shifting, an ever shifting crown. As I, I do recall, in the um, in the medieval period, the theology was the queen of the disciplines. So, right. um, yeah, I mean, everything was most things at most levels by by European intellectuals in that period. I mean, right into, you would say, the 18th and century, we're looked at through a kind of a prism of religion, a prism of the, of, 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 of divinity. Of divinity. Mm. And, and, you know, it sounds, you made a, a, a reasonable case that without the Sermon on the Mount, there would be no David Hume. And without David Hume, there would be no contemporary Scottish society. And you can trace a line all the way from Correct. Palestine. Absolutely. Uh, because uh, these um, the, the moral philosophers in particular, which Hume was one, moral philosophers in particular are, are trying to understand uh, uh, and find out why um, in, re- in, in a very strong and umbilical relationship, if you like, to Christian teachings. Because if you could argue that Christian teachers... Uh, were the first moral philosophers. Um, so it's not, not surprising that um, uh, modern, modern moral philosophers find, it, find great difficulty in escaping the grip of what has gone before. <clears throat> and what about, um, in terms of talking about morality, what is, um, what is the proper way to act, if you like, from philosophers? It's, it's undeniable that in Scottish church history, we have plenty of examples of what is not the way to act by any reasonable standards um, today. What would you say is the the legacy that we've had in Protestant Scotland, where there's not only been tension, but um, outright campaigns against the likes of Irish Catholics who, who suffered enormous persecution in our history? Yeah, well, I mean, um, no, no, um, no Christian 
Um, no, no Christian church has got um, in any way the monopoly of virtue, um, and in, in, uh, has got the in, in monotomy to be free of sin, in that sense, that spiritual sense. Because it's, uh, the, these organisations are human based, and it's inevitable they will reflect also the pressures and difficulties and attitudes of society at, at any one time. I mean, we were talking, David, just a few seconds ago about um, the impact of religion and human affairs over the very long run uh, in a whole variety of different ways. But equally, um, the, if you like, the human aspects, uh, not the spiritual or religious aspects, the, those human aspects have had a strong impact on religion. And regrettably, um, in terms of, say, witch hunting, um, you know, um, the uh, attack on the other, whatever that other might be, uh, uh, and particularly in periods of economic stress for a community, uh, which can lead to persecution of the other, that that, um, that unfortunately is part of the interrelationship between humanity and religion and vice versa. Because it is, it is the organisations of Christianity are designed by human people um, that might that might be influenced influenced so believers might have it by the divine. But they're essentially human human constructs, and if you take the example you've just referred to of the anti-Catholic campaigns, anti-Irish Catholic campaigns of the 1920s, I mean it's fascinating, for example, to note that in the founding pamphlet for this long campaign, which occurred in the 20s and 30s, um, people of Irishmen of orange extraction were exempt, but equally people of Catholic extraction who were also native born uh, sorry who had um, uh, who had been natives of Scotland for generations they were not, they were not attacked as well this was this was almost an essentially not a religious campaign but a racial campaign mm-hmm. and, and quite unbelievably we're looking back um Scotland in the mid 19th century and, and, and I'm not making a point in relation to religions at that period but Scotland in the mid 19th century, rapidly became a centre of excellence for racial and racist thought. Mm-hmm. Um, and some of that <clears throat> circulated, you know, through the intellectual cap classes uh, further down. Now, you compare what occurred during that crisis in the 20s and early 30s to, you know, the ec- ecumenical relationships which exist today in Scotland between the churches, and also, most importantly of all, the act... Um, taken by the, the decision taken by the Church of Scotland in 2001 to admit the, uh, the, the wrongdoing uh, of the earlier part of the 20th century and apologise. I mean, that's a reflection of the fact that, that human organisations change. They change their, their attitude, human constructed organisations change their attitude in relation to different influences over time. What the Church of Scotland did in that year was good, unambiguously good. But the irony is that some of the things that occurred in the 20s and 30s were also affected by external forces. Um, I mean, one of the most obvious was the terrible economic crisis which occurred in Scotland in that period and and therefore made the fight for jobs, perhaps leading eventually to some form of religious discrimination in the job market perhaps inevitable. Mm. So, I mean, that goes back in a sense to my own discipline, David, that what we try to do as historical scholars uh, is not to condemn because it's very difficult or to judge in that sense because it's very difficult unless you're very close to the modern era. I mean, we can certainly condemn Nazism, for example, because we know that even by judged by contemporary standards, in the 1930s and 1940s, it was an evil, unambiguously evil force. But what's more difficult is to is to understand the values of those people who lived two and three hundred years ago. And regrettably, in the current um, uh, Black Lives Matter um, storm, uh, that has now been done regularly. That there's uh, so many spokesmen, both within and without the UK, particularly in the USA, I would say, have been guilty of anachronistic behaviour, mm-hmm. of the kind of statements that if they appeared in an undergraduate essay would ensure failure. Mm-hmm. 
It's um yeah, and and I think I think that's lamentable, and it's something we even need to be, you know, careful of with um even in the church and a reading of scripture. And I I try to encourage that from the pulpit and going mm. that it is it is uh, a a a flawed thing to come at the scriptures with the coloured by the worldview and the perceptions of today and try to see how the scriptures stack up against that in a very um, low resolution way. Yeah. There's, there are several steps we're meant to go through in order to arrive at something that's a bit more um, cogent yes. to get there. Well, and it exactly, sounds like you're seeing exactly, things happening in history. It's exactly the same process, intellectually. Yeah. <clears throat> um, it, it's And what about the... It, you alluded to the fact that you know the Church of Scotland in 2001 basically engaged in repentance, for want of a better term, which has helped ecumenical relations and made the Scottish Church picture a, a much uh, better landscape than certainly in the early part of the century. You also touched on the fact that um, all these disciplines are always interlinked. The economic and social pressures lead to religious behaviours or uh, race behaviours, moral behaviours that are uh, considered um, erroneous. Mm. <clears throat> but I'm, I'm interested in, in what you think, perhaps, do you see a connection between those behaviours in the 20s and 30s and being sanctioned by you know the highest religious authority in the land and the continuing uh, scourge that we have of sectarianism in Scotland today, or, or would you say that's more of a non-religious, that's just become a, a, a tribal war? Yes, I mean, I think uh, to the extent that it exists, uh, then that is the case. Um, I, I'm very interested, or have been uh, very interested in sectarianism as one of the themes that um, I've studied and thought about. Um, actually, in the same year that we've just been talking about, in 2001, I edited uh, a collection of essays called Scotland Shame Question um, Mark Sectarianism in Modern Scotland. It was triggered by the now notorious lecture given by James Macmillan at the Edinburgh International Book Festival, um, or it might even be the, the Edinburgh International Festival, um, just a few years before that. And this book was intended to to um, to discuss from a scholarly position, a scholarly perspective, um, whether Macmillan's claim that Scotland was inveterately anti-Catholic, as late as this, this is the late 90s we're, we're talking about. Um, so um, I, the, my, my interest dates from then. I now take the position uh, that in 2020, uh, there are only, uh, and I may be over -op optimistic on this, um, but there's um, uh, uh, only embers of this um, uh, Scottish disease, if you want to call it that, left. Only um, the remains of the virus, if you will. Uh, in 2015, the government's advisory committee uh, on sectarianism in Scotland, in its final report, did use the word, only the remains of traditional sectarianism uh, exist. And there's a whole variety of reasons why this is the case, um, or this this has been the case in more more recent uh, more recent years. So, to the extent that that it still exists, it is tribalism, it is the other, the sense of the other. Um, uh, uh, but the thing that will that has been killing it is that in so many aspects of life. Um, occupation, intermarriage, um, education, you name it. There's now uh, almost a, a total parity between people who are brought up in the Protestant tradition and those brought up in the Catholic tradition. Of course, you'll still see vile activity at some of the old firm matches and, and the like, and there'll still be scroll things scrawled on walls, et cetera, et cetera. But in terms of the reality, we're dealing now with a different reality um, of the type that existed uh, when uh, when I reached maturity in the 1950s and, and early, early, 19, early 1960s. 
uh, it's it's uh, th there is no comparison. And the other thing, to go back to your point about ecumenism, the way it strikes me now is that Catholic priests and bishops and Protestant ministers and Kirk session elders are now brothers in arms. They're now brothers in arms in terms of their their joint uh, Christian Christian commitment and the desire to ensure that Christian values remain in our society, uh, despite the you know the range of um, if you like opposing uh, opposing forces. You'll not pass on that. Um, well, uh, Tom, that's more or less taken us up to the modern day, and I think that's uh, a very appropriate place to bring our discussion to a conclusion. Um, for me, it has been a fascinating walk through a lot of the religious landscape that is Scotland's past, and so I'm very grateful to you for joining us and walking us through that, um, giving us your time, and, and I'm sure I speak on behalf of those folks who tune in um, when I thank you for that as well. So thanks very much, Tom, and uh, wish you all the best and uh, uh, continue to enjoy your uh, not being employed, as you said. <laughs> yeah, I'm still writing. Thanks very much, David. I've thoroughly enjoyed the discussion. Uh, and due to the way that you've, um, you've uh, if you like, organised or dealt with the flow of the conversation, I do hope that um, people will enjoy the sort of things that, uh, who watch this, the sort of things that we've, we've both opened up. Uh, during the last hour. Thanks, Tom. All the best. All the best. Bye.